Well, as you can see from the screen, the, the title of my message here just before lunch is Leaving a Legacy of Imitating God. And as you're thinking about that title, you have to, of course, think about legacy in general. And everyone leaves behind some kind of legacy. It might be good. It might be bad. You might intend to leave behind the legacy, or maybe you don't intend to leave behind the legacy, but whether you plan on it or don't, whether it's good or bad, you're leaving behind a legacy. Because legacy is generally, and others have probably covered this, but just generally referring to anything that is received from one who goes before you, an ancestor or a predecessor, somebody who came first. So anything that you receive from them can be referred to as a legacy. Now, it can involve physical objects, inanimate objects, monetary types of things, but it often centers on the beliefs and traditions that are passed on from one generation to another. That's more often than not the legacy that we're talking about, especially my, I wasn't raised with any great amount of financial means. My mother used to always joke about the family jewels, which were non-existent, and she always said, well, at least you'll never have to fight about that. So they're thinking about a financial legacy, there wouldn't be that. You know, but you think about being a second generation Christian, being even... Uh, you know, being even the pastor of a church that you grew up in, the reality is that much of that was a byproduct of a legacy of faith that my parents laid out for me as they taught me about Jesus Christ. They taught me about the Word of God, and they showed me through their lives that that is the thing to prioritize more than the other alternatives that were available. Now, I still have a volition of my own. I'm still responsible for whether I would respond to that example or I would reject it. But most often when we're, and certainly as we're here today, when we're talking about legacy, we're talking about passing on beliefs and traditions and viewpoints more so than we are physical objects. And the primary emphasis when you're thinking about a legacy is the lasting or the enduring influence one has on others. What is the influence you're going to have on those that come after you or that you leave behind? And so as you see that that is the, the focus, is this influence, then this conference has been focused on the spiritual influence that you're going to leave behind. If legacy is primarily associated with influence, what is the spiritual influence that you're going to leave behind? And unsurprisingly, God desires for you to live a life that is modeled after him and empowered by his spirit so that you would have the opportunity to leave behind a positive spiritual legacy, a legacy that would be beneficial to those that come behind you instead of the alternative, which is to leave behind a spiritual legacy that would be detrimental to the ones that come behind you. And for those of you who are parents, for those of you who have other people that you know are watching you, are modeling their behavior, modeling their thinking after you, that's convicting, isn't it? Not only do I have the possibility of leaving behind maybe no legacy, but in all reality, there is no neutral. It's either going to be a positive, helpful spiritual legacy that will promote their spiritual growth and their spiritual interest in the things of faith will help them spiritually. Or in fact, when I'm gone, I'm going to actually carry on in a sense in their lives as a detriment to their spiritual well-being. That is a big thing to consider. And it's one or the other, friends. It, there, it's not in between. It'll be one or the other. Your children, those that you've influenced, those that outlive you, those that lived life with you, that, that you rubbed up against or rubbed, that sounds bad, that you, that you came across in life, they'll either be seeing that those interactions after you're gone, they'll either carry on as something that's helpful or detrimental. So in these verses that I've been assigned, Paul highlights God's desire that you imitate him. And then he gives several specific illustrations about what that entails and contrastingly, what that does not entail. So there's going to be both 
aspects of it, let's dive into this passage because it's a lot. Uh, Some of you who were from Heritage Trail, you know that last week I planned on covering three verses on Sunday morning and I got through one. So we got 17 here, so let's buckle up and get moving. All right, verse 1, chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. And that is the general principle that anybody would need to take away if they're considering this topic of leaving behind a positive legacy. It's going to have to be one that is modeled after imitating God in contrast to we're going to see the world around us or the satanic influence around us. It's going to have to start here. This is a, a very generic way of saying what is ultimately the issue. The only way my legacy, the influence that I'm going to have on others, could possibly be positive if nothing in me, in my flesh, is good, if not one single thing in my nature is good, not one bone in my body, then that part of me isn't going to be able to leave behind a useful or positive spiritual influence. So anything that I leave behind that would be influential in a positive way in the next generation's life is going to have to be from the divine nature. It's going to have to be modeled after God himself, and it's going to have to be empowered by his spirit. Let's go have lunch. For those of you who start drifting off on me here, because I know your stomachs are are growling and what have you, don't lose that. That That is the big picture here when it comes to leaving a legacy, and others have already been speaking to that point. I'm just repeating it. But be imitators of God as dear children. Let's unpack it. It starts there if you look down with therefore. So that's going to tie back to this specific example of modeling the forgiveness of God from 432. So the last, the way that ended was, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted and forgiving. So we have three qualities there that are laid out. Those are the byproduct of the mentality that would be undergirding those would be a spirit-led, a spirit-dependent mentality that sought to live life in a manner that was directed by God and empowered by His Spirit. And those were three specific things that are listed. And so then it ends with forgiving one another. So kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, all directed to other believers is what that refers to one another. Even though, as God in Christ forgave you. So there's our hint that this now carryover thought is going to be about this example that God has provided, or these qualities that are true in God, and they were exemplified through the life of Christ specifically, but they're qualities of God that he then says, therefore, in light of seeing that those qualities flow from God himself, now be imitators of him as dear children. And so as we get into this first word, it says, therefore, be. And so that's the first word we're going to dive into a little bit more here, be. Therefore, be imitators of God. Well, it's defined as this, to begin to be, to become. It's not talking about this idea that in the Christian life, somehow there's going to be an easy button. Maybe some of you have seen those commercials where you just hit this button once, and then from there on out, you are an imitator of God. It's talking about a process, a process that is going to take place over time. It's not talking about a moment in time. It's talking about a process that will take place over time as you become an imitator. You begin to be and then continue on with becoming to be an imitator of God. And that's why I love that this conference, though many of us refer to it as the Man of God Conference, there's actually a really critical word in front of Man of God when you look at the literature for the the conference. It's becoming a man of God. And maybe it wasn't on this year's thing, is it? Who's got the thing? Is it on there? Pretty big word. They, they got it right across the top. Becoming a man of God. We're all works in progress. None of us have arrived. God is seeking to mold us, to conform us, to change us, to whittle away at us, to kick, have us kick off the weights and the sins that are besetting us. 
They're so easily besetting us. Remember that. It wasn't hard for them to beset us. They were easily <laughs> ensnaring us and besetting us. So that's the idea. This is what spiritual growth and maturity involves, becoming something that you're not by nature. And this is an imperative. I don't like to get into the grammar too much, but something I'll say, I was talking to John Clark yesterday about this, just happens to be a conversation that we got into. But when you're thinking about imperatives, uh, of course many you know, say these are the commands of the Bible. That's not wrong. But they're instructions that are given from a loving Heavenly Father that are intended for your benefit. It's guidance. Sometimes when you see command, you think about like a, a, a faceless governmental entity or something, a police sort of an arrangement, uh, where that, they, they command you to do something. But the motive, the motive isn't necessarily pure. The motive isn't necessarily for your benefit. So I think... I just look at it this way. This is critical to your spiritual success. It's an instruction given by a loving Heavenly Father that is intended to benefit you. Remember, God is always for you. There is nothing that He directs you to in His Word that wasn't intended to benefit you. And until you see that, you'll never take in any of these instructions the way they were intended. They were intended to be received by a son from a father, motivated by the father's love for the son and the son's love response to the father's love. And I didn't always see that. I didn't always understand that. I hope, I hope you do. But it's an imperative. It's also present tense. Meaning start this process immediately and then let it continue. It's passive voice too. Now there's some argument about whether it's middle or passive, but... Again, I, I barely know enough to even use these words up here, so don't think I'm a scholar about it. But I think the better view here is passive, that only God could ever produce this outcome in you. Yeah, now, yes, there is a positive volitional response involved in allowing him to work in you, desiring that, seeking, seeking this. But it's not you who are going to make yourself into an imitator of God. It's as you respond to God's provision for your life and the empowerment of his spirit, as you're convinced that he's worthy of your faith and your trust, as you learn to trust him more, you're going to depend on him more. As you depend on him more, you're going to be walking by means of the spirit. As the spirit is the one directing your life, it's going to be a life that more and more reflects God, the qualities of God himself or the characteristics of God himself. You're going to be becoming an imitator of God, and that's the way I would see it. If, if, if you think it's a different, you know, that would just be a, a difference of opinion. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have to be dogmatic about it, but I think that's the way it always is as you look at these passages. It, the focus is never on pulling your boots up for Jesus. It's never on making yourself into something for Jesus. It's on realizing that without you, I can do nothing. I am nothing but for the grace of God. Anything that I am, it's because God has made those changes in me and is working in and through me as a clay pot, a clay vessel, an instrument that he can use. Not because there's anything special about me or that I've somehow manufactured this or made this happen through my own strength. Now, imitators of God, what are we to become? Become imitators of God. It involves copying or following after another. The idea there would be taking God as your pattern. And I just spoke to this, so we won't belabor this point, but the only way divine qualities could be present in your life is if they are produced supernaturally. And you see that in chapter 3, if you were to look back and look at verse 16, we're not going to labor the point, but when you look back at verse 16, this has already been covered, but how are you strengthened? How, how is the Christian life made possible? How is something that's impossible because God's character is the exact opposite of my nature, by nature, my old sin nature? Well, it's going to have to be strengthened with might by his spirit. That's the only way that I'm ever going to be an imitator of God. So then as we keep going, we say imitate God, okay, but as opposed to what? Imitate God, but as opposed to what? If I'm imitating him, what am I not taking my directives from? What am I not imitating? And, of course, that is part of what Pastor Roxer was talking about as he was even introducing me, 
I'm not going to be imitating or following after or patterning my life or creating a manner of living that is influenced by the world around me. I'm going to be seeking to allow God to make changes in my thinking and work through me through the power of his spirit to influence me by his truth so that his qualities and characteristics can be produced in and through me. And we see that in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world. That's the alternative. If I'm not becoming an imitator of God, taking him as my pattern, then I'm, the alternative is that by default I'm becoming conformed to this world. Again, something that doesn't necessarily take place overnight. Something that even in the life of the believer is possible. That's who Paul is writing to. Do not be conformed to this world. This can happen to us, and it does happen to us. And it doesn't happen, like I say, all at once. Pretty soon, if you're not careful, if you haven't been renewing your mind with the truth of God's word, hearing the word of God, fellowshipping with other believers, getting some divine viewpoint, what happens is that pretty soon you'll glance up into a mirror and you'll get a glimpse of yourself and you'll say, I don't even recognize that person. I don't know how I got to be there, but I don't even recognize who I've become because I've become conformed to a way of thinking and then the attitudes and behavior that comes along with that of the world instead of the Savior. And that happens as the alternative to becoming an imitator of God as I become conformed to the world. But what's the contrast? This is the same way of saying become an imitator of God. Become transformed by the renewing of your mind. And in doing that, you'll prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You're saying that it's God's will that I would be transformed into his image, the image of his son, that I would become, I would pattern my existence after him, that I would, I would seek and have a heart that wants to have his characteristics be produced in and through me by his spirit. Yeah, that's God's will. What's God's will for your life? Right there that you become, it'd be less and less about self and more and more about him, that you would be less and less like you and more and more like him, that in a greater and greater measure, you would quit putting the focus on yourself, but you'd put the focus on him. You'd quit trusting yourself and you'd trust him more. That you'd quit walking and working and operating under your own strength and you would learn to depend and walk under the influence and the empowerment of his spirit more. That's it. Progress over time to grow. So, what we're talking about as the alternative being conformed to this world, what are we talking about? If the alternative to imitating God is to imitate the world, what does that mean? Well, it refers to a system of thinking and behavior under the influence and control of Satan that is in opposition to God and excludes him. Now, I want to say this. This part... Technology makes life so much better. All right. Excludes him. I got it. I got it. We have a similar system. Of course, it's not exactly the same. Our system is somewhat possessed. Uh, <laughs> anyway. I digress. It excludes him. You want to know what worldly thinking is? We can, you, can, you can confuse so many things in Christianity. It's not confusing. Worldly thinking is any thinking that excludes God. That's it. You want to identify whether or not you're in a good place spiritually, just ask yourself, am I including God in the things that I'm doing, the places I'm going, the things that I'm say saying? Am I, am I taking him with me to the places that I'm traveling to? Am I taking him with me into the conversations that I'm having with people? Or am I excluding him, pushing him off to the side saying, I don't want you or need you right now. But be imitators of God, which means I, I shouldn't be an imitator of the world. And you, you ought to remember, I know you all know this or most of you know this, but copying and imitating and being influenced by the world, that's the natural default. Let me say that again. Imitating the world, that's the natural default. So if you think there's such a thing as just shifting this thing into neutral, and staying halfway between being influenced by the world and being an imitator of God. There is no such place. Now, sometimes we want that. Sometimes we'd like to kind of 
Just play that middle ground, but it doesn't exist. The default, when you're not proactively seeking after God's truth, when you're not making time for it, when you're not praying that he would give you that desire, do you ever pray for that? That he'd give you the will? It's God that works in us both the will and to do of his good pleasure. Do you ever pray that, God, give me that desire? Give me a will. Give me a heart that wants to seek after you. Because if that's not the case, there, God isn't going to force Christian living on you. He's not going to force you to become just like him. I will say in, in some ways he will one day. <laughs> He's going to say, out with the old. There is no more sin nature. You are now going to be glorified and you're going to be just like me. Well, not just like me. I don't think we'll ever be exactly like God. But we won't get to hold on to sin any longer at some point in time. All right, now as dear children, how am I supposed to do this? As dear children. Be imitators of God as dear children. Well, as describes the manner of doing this. That's the manner of doing it. What's the posture and mindset behind trying to do this? Well, dear it would be better translated, in my opinion, as beloved. Many translations have it that way. As beloved children. That's the manner or mindset or posture that you should have in seeking to become an imitator of God. And that's the same, the reason beloved is maybe a better translation there is because the same, it's the same base word as agape. And agape means to be dearly loved and cherished. You know, I was having a conversation with a believer from this church not that long ago. You know, sometimes we define agape by the way, the way that that love is manifested in our lives. So sacrificial, selfless love, doing what's best for another in light of eternity, uh, with, with regard to known biblical truths, without regard to personal expense or merit, something along those lines. But that's not what the word itself means. That, that's how that word is manifested in our lives, but it means one that is dearly loved and cherished. So I am going to become an imitator of God as with a mindset of one who is dearly loved and cherished, and that is just so powerful. This word means to be preferred above all else. It sometimes referred to it sometimes refers to the affection that is bestowed on an only child. The center of the apple of one's eye the center of your affection, preferred above all else. The idea there is God has my picture on his fridge. He's got your picture too. He's got a lot of fridges, friends. But on that fridge that represents me, it's only my picture on that fridge. You know of some parents that only have one child? Do you know of some of those? Okay. Okay. If you were to look at their fridge, there's the third place spelling bee thing. I stole that from John Clark. Uh, there's every picture from everything on that fridge. Now, when you have two kids, it's kind of split in half. Once you get three or more, you just don't even bother. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sure the three or mores have a lot of pictures on their fridges, too. <laughs> I take that back. I'm sorry. Hey, if you're one of a big family, your parent loves you very much, too. <laughs> I don't know why I looked at one of the Denver kids when I said that. <laughs> oh, man. I'm just digging here, man. Digging deep. All right, but as dear what? Children. The Christian life can never be stripped of this familial, relational context. Children naturally emulate their parents is part of the idea here. This can be good or bad, of course. You know, there's a country song that I used to love back in the day. Now I'm too spiritual for country music. <laughs> Just keep on digging. Just keep digging. I, I joke, I jest, but one of those songs that I, I loved, it was a song that said, I've been watching you, Dad. Ain't that cool? I'm your buckaroo. I want to be like you. You eat all my food and grow as tall as you are. And you think, ain't that cool? And my notes to me here say, no, it's not cool. I've been watching you, Dad. And there's a part in the song where he says, 
The traffic light went straight from green to red, and he slammed on the brakes. And he said his son's McNugget meal and his orange drink went flying around the car. And he must have said, he said something then. And later that, later that day, he heard the son. He said, then my four-year-old said a four-letter word. It started with S, and I was concerned. And I said, son, where did you learn to talk like that? And he said, I've been watching you, Dad. Ain't that cool? <clears throat> Children naturally imitate their, emulate their parents, and that can be good or bad. But in a child, the desire to imitate is usually the product of admiration and affection brought about in response to his father's immense, it should say, love. Immense love for him. This switched from... Uh, 16.9 format to 4.3, so I lost a couple of things here, but uh, his immense love for him. That's the thing. A, a child is usually not seeking to emulate. Uh, they end up doing it anyway, but they're not seeking to emulate or imitate a father that shows them nothing but disdain or hatred. It's the father that they look up to. It's a father that they have affection for or admiration for, usually because that father has shown them how much they care for them and how much they love them. And that's kind of the idea that we're getting at here. God wants you to be motivated by his unfathomable love for you, not fear, not shame, not guilt, not obligation. So many people in Christianity seek to make our response to God about fear and shame and guilt and obligation. There is nothing about the Christian life lived the way God intends that is motivated by that. God wants you to be motivated by his unfathomable love for you. There's no, it's indescribable the amount of love that God has for you. That's the thing that is supposed to be motivating you. And I think we cannot preach that enough. We could not remind ourselves enough about this. That is why I want to live my life in a way that would bring you glory is because I see how deep the Father's love for us. We sing that song. It all comes back to relationship. It comes back to this familial connection that we have with the Father. It's a relationship. It's a family. That's the idea. And then I say this again, I'm not going to get into it as much, but God is ultimately the power source behind any favorable emulation. Now, we see that imitating God would mean that God's qualities and characteristics would be manifest in our lives. We're going to see that here in a second. For that to be true, you're saying that God's supernatural characteristics are going to be produced in, in and through me? Yeah, which means that it's going to have to supernaturally be produced. A finite man, a natural man, cannot produce supernatural things through his own strength. That doesn't even make sense. So if supernatural things are going to come through me, if I'm going to become an imitator of those kind of qualities, then God is going to have to be the one who is going to empower that. And now we're going to look at three specific illustrations of what imitating God might look like in terms of a manner of living. The first one is walk in love. And I, on your notes, I have not in love ungodliness, because there's always contrasts here. If I'm going to imitate God, it means I'm not going to be imitating the world. If I'm going to be influenced by God, I'm not going to be at that present moment influenced by the world. If I'm going to walk in love, then it means at the same time, I'm not going to be walking in a manner characteristic of the world or those that don't even know Christ. So we dig into this. We're going to have to pick up the pace a little bit. Walk, defined as one's manner of living, a customary description of how you live. It's another way of saying the same thing, a manner of living. This is in the present tense too. Start doing this and continue doing it. Active voice, you choose to walk this way as empowered by the Spirit. God doesn't force your manner of living to look a certain way. He desires it to look a certain way. He provides everything necessary for it to live that way. You've been blessed beyond all measure, chapters 1 through 3 of Ephesians that were covered by Kurt. But now you have to make this choice. As empowered by God's Spirit, as I respond to God's love, am I going to want this to be my 
manner of living. Imperative mood, this is critical. God intends this to be for your benefit. Your spiritual success or the outcome God wants, which is for you to thrive spiritually, is dependent on you heeding these instructions. Now walk, it says, in love. And love is defined as to cherish, to have great affection, concern, care or warm regard for someone, to take pleasure in someone. So walk in love. Now we're going to see it. There's three parts to this. So bask in, so walk in, have your manner of living that you're standing in God's love for you, his warm affection and care for you, the pleasure that he takes in you. That's a big part of what, what is in, being focused on here. Walk in love, meaning have your manner of living be one that is abiding in God's love, that is meditating in that, that is resting in God's love for you, that is surrounding yourself and leaning into God's love for you. But there's a second aspect to it. Also, have your manner of living described by your love response to the love that he's shown you. We love him because he first loved us. Some of it has to do with that response of love to him. And then the third part is the outworking of that love directed towards others. So have your manner of living described by love. The idea is allow love to, to characterize your entire manner of living. And that got cut off, I'm sorry your entire manner of living. Now, as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, we see. As Christ has also loved us and given himself for us, meaning this is your example. Remember that this is all about reflecting him. Remember that the big principle is become an imitator of God. Now, allow that love to be reproduced in your life as, it, as you bask in God's love for you, your love responds to him in the way that God wants you to reflect that love into the lives of the people that he has put in your life. That's the amazing thing about you talk about a legacy. It's about influencing people. Influencing people with your ungodliness, which we're going to gloss over a little bit later. No, influencing people by God's qualities and characteristics that are being reflected in you starting with Love. So how is God, if God was our example, then how is that love manifested? Sacrificially, selflessly, and unconditionally. Not without regard for merit. See, God's very nature is characterized by love, and if we're imitating him, then that love is going to flow in and through us. 1 John 4, 8 says, He who does not love is not presently loving, does not know God, is not presently knowing God, because God is, is love. God equals love. It's a part of who God is. So if, if we're becoming imitators of him as led and directed and empowered by his spirit, then those kind of qualities are going to come out through us is what Paul is getting at here. And then you say, as opposed to what? As opposed to what? And this is part of what, you know, is the emphasis of this message too. What is the alternate association. Well, it's a manner of living associated with the things that are in opposition of God. So if you look at verses 3 through 7, you're going to see that there's always these contrasts being set up. Walk in love as opposed to what? Well, we saw that contrast developed in chapter 4, verse 1, walk worthy, and then 417. And what did that mean? Not walking, no longer walking as the Gentiles walk. Meaning, if I'm going to walk as directed by God's characteristics and God's qualities and being influenced by God and imitating God, then it's not going to be associated with the things that are in opposition to God. And I'm just cherry-picking a few things here because there's no way I have time to go through all of this. But the first one is, let it not even be named among you. And so when you're thinking about this section, but fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, let it not be named among you. Then he goes on to neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting. That's not fitting, just like it said up above. That's not fitting for saints, but rather instead giving thanks. And so as you think about let it not even be named among you. We'll just take that first one though there because it was a part of you know, what I was supposed to highlight, though I don't really have time to get into it too much. When you talk about a legacy that is influenced by God, it's not going to be a legacy of sexual immorality. The first word here is the one that most, this is, a, call this the dirty half dozen. But fornication is the one, the word pornea, 
uh, comes from that. Porn, porn comes from that, that Greek word. And then even uncleanness can refer to uh, sexual immorality of any kind, but it also can just refer to uncleanness of any kind. So that's kind of a catch-all thing that would cover every person. And the same thing about covetousness, seeking after or having a preference or wanting something that you don't have. Basically, it's not being satisfied. Everyone would suffer from that. Filthiness, foolish talking, coarse jesting. All of these things are not fitting. But if you want to talk about a legacy, a legacy of purity, sexual purity, I came across this statistic and it said that the porn industry brings in $15 billion annually in the United States. $15 billion annually. You know how much Hollywood brings in annually? Less than that. I think it's $12 billion or so. You're, you're saying that Hollywood, which itself is a manifestation of everything that is in contrast, contradiction in many ways to God's standards. So Hollywood itself, even at best, is still a distraction from the things of faith most often. At, at best, it's not promoting the standards and the, and the focus and the priorities that the Word of God is. That's at best. So if that is an influence that is a distraction from the things of faith, and that's 12 billion, now you're saying that this other industry by itself is $15 billion industry. Now you say, is that something that maybe we ought to be aware of? That we ought to be intentional about in our thinking? We ought to put up some safeguards? That we ought to try to give some good wisdom and some good guidance to our, our sons and our daughters about the dangers that are associated with that and how it's not fitting for a saint to be influenced or be captivated by that in place of being captivated by the Savior and allowing Him to work in and through them so that they can grow in their faith and they can become more and more like Christ Jesus, that they can become imitators of God too? We can't be deceived about some of these dangers that we face. We can't just never talk about them. I guarantee that it's a problem that men here have faced or are facing currently. It's a problem that our children have faced or will face in the future. And I don't think that's the main focus of this section. In fact, it's one word out of 17 verses that explicitly even talks about, you know, what we would call sexual purity. But the, the bigger point is that you don't want to have your mind influenced by the things that the world lifts up as something that would be worth being captivated by. One of them that is prevalent in our day is sexual immorality. Now, there's plenty of other things, too. Uh, in, in churches, sometimes sexual immorality takes uh, a second seat to, very often, to self-righteousness, judgmentalism, unforgiveness, bitterness, pride, arrogance, elitism, spiritual elitism, being too busy for other people. Which, if God says... You ought to think not only of your own affairs, but also the affairs of others, and you're too busy for other people? We wouldn't traditionally say that's a sin. I, I'd say it, it's, it goes against what God's will and desire is for your life, and sometimes that's how we define sin, something that goes against God's standards. I need to move on. So, walk in love. Christ was your example as opposed to what? Let not these things even be named among you. These things represent the existence of an unbeliever apart from God. I can't go into this. This is, a, this is a passage that is heavily debated as to who this is referring to. It's referring to the uh, unbelievers and the things that are associated with being in opposition to God. And as a believer, although you can still associate with the thinking attitudes and behaviors of the world practically, all of these things could be true of you, although Paul is contrasting them to the one who is under the influence of the Spirit of God, the one who is a child of God. He's saying you should be characterized, your manner of living should be characterized by God's qualities, not the qualities or the characteristics associated with the world that you were saved out from with the unsaved, with the unbeliever, with the one who doesn't know God. That's what he's getting at here. He's, saying, he's not saying that you couldn't participate in these things practically. He's saying because believers do 
He's saying that it doesn't fit you anymore positionally. It's not a good fit. It's not who you are anymore. Don't put on the old manner of living. Put that off instead. And that's what Paul's getting at in Romans 6, 1 through 2. And I'll have to just say it here, but it says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And the answer is certainly not. God forbid. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? That's what he's getting at. If you're an imitator of God, if you're walking as characterized by God's nature, the divine nature, then it ought to be in opposition to the types of things that characterize the ungodly world around you. That's why I have it titled, Walk in Love and Not Ungodliness. Don't walk in association with the things that are opposed to God. Now that list, it's, a, it's the dirty half dozen. It could be very long. That's just some of them. Some of the attitudes and behaviors that represent opposition to Jesus Christ. Another phrase that we see in this section is, let no one deceive you. And when you think about that, that's including yourself. And a world system controlled and influenced by Satan. You know, self-deception is the number one problem that I believe most Christians are facing. It's very close. I wouldn't be dogmatic about it. Obviously, the deception of Satan is very similar. Got to be close. But I think the thing a Christian deals with as much as anything is always believing that they're in a better place spiritually than they really are. Always sugarcoating things. Always having this mindset that says, I already have this figured out or I already know this or this is boring to me because this is just a repeat of things that I already know. Why do you think the Bible repeats itself over and over and over again? Because our skulls are too thick for it to sink in one time. It has to be repeated over and over and over again. But let no one deceive you. The world is not a neutral ground or a playground. It's a battleground. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. But it's not, it, the world is not neutral. It's not friendly space. We go out into the world to shine God's light into what? Darkness. We don't go to shine it into somewhat illuminated space. We go to shine it into darkness. And then the last phrase I want to pull out of this section is, you is implied there. You do not be partakers with them. So let it not even be named among you. Let no one deceive you into thinking that that is the way that God wants you to go with your thinking and then the corresponding behavior. And do not even be partakers with them. And that's just defined as one who consumes or indulges in something. And throughout this, there's been this contrast between you, which is assumed in this clause, but you and them. That is why I don't have, again, I didn't want the focus to be trying to explain this passage, but that is why this is not talking about believers who somehow this is some test of the genuineness of their faith or something along those lines. That's not what it's about at all. Paul is contrasting you, the believers he's talking to, with them, those that are living under the influence of the world system that believers are being tempted to participate in, even though positionally they're no longer identified with the darkness, they're now identified with who they are in Christ. They're positionally in Christ. He's saying, now walk in a way that would be consistent with your position practically. Allow that to be your manner of living. You see, Paul would never warn against something that couldn't possibly occur. Christians can partake in all of this. He's just saying, don't live in association with those things any longer. Put off the old man. Put on the new man, which he gets to in, what is that, Colossians or Philippians or Colossians. So then we have walk in light, not darkness. Verse 8 is where that, this section picks up. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. And it's kind of, it's one of these ideas. In case this previous illustration was unclear, I'm going to give you yet another illustration of this contrast between what an imitator of God's life would be characterized by and the opposition, or the alternative, which is a life that would be characterized by the things of the world. And so this starts to be somewhat repetitive, though it's just another variation of the same thing. He's saying, you were once darkness, he says here, referring to their existence prior to getting saved, but now you are light, positionally. It refers to their new positional identity in Christ. Now he's saying, 
he said this in Romans, but same idea. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light that put off, put on idea. What kind of clothes are you going to wear? A uniform that's associated with the world? You've been traded off of that team. You've actually been bought off of that team. Your rights have been redeemed off of that team. You now are on another team. Are you going to walk into a game for the whoever, for the Masabi East Giants wearing a Duluth East uniform? Not if you want to live. <laughs> no. Your rights were purchased by Masabi East from Duluth East, so now you play for the Masabi East team. So wear that uniform. Identify with that way of existing or way of living. So then we have, well, what is the desired result of this positional reality? If I'm to, I was once darkness, but I'm now light, then we have the statement here, walk as children of the light. Have that be characteristic of your manner of living. And that's another attribute of God himself. 1 John 1, 5 says, the night, or this is the message which we have heard from him, and we declare to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Well, how would this manner of living be possible? That should always be our thought as we're going through this so we don't get off track. Well, this will automatically be a byproduct of living life under the influence of God's Spirit. We see that in our text when we see that for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And that's in verse 9 there. The fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. That's how this is possible. This is what the Spirit will produce as a byproduct of your occupation with Jesus Christ. And then you say, as opposed to what again? Well, having fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness from verse 11. That's the alternative. Some of that would be the sexual immorality that I was talking about with fornication. But it could be true of anything that the world prioritizes at the exclusion of God, anything that excludes God, which could be Christianity that is done from the flesh, that is empowered by the flesh, which is done in your own strength, that excludes God. You could be sitting right here having fellowship with darkness practically, not positionally, if what you're doing, what you're thinking, what you're feeling, your behavior is motivated by your flesh or your humanity instead of involving God in it. Some people just don't see that. Are you excluding God right now, right where you're sitting? Well, that's the unfruitful works of darkness. That's one part of that. Now it says this. All things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. All things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. And there's a couple of things that I wanted to say about this, but it's this. You expose darkness by shining the light not fixating on darkness. Let me say this again. If you are a light bearer for Jesus Christ, you expose darkness by shining your light, not fixating on the darkness. I hear so many Christians, all they talk about is the darkness of the world around them, all the things that are wrong with the world. They pepper each other's ears with this stuff. God wants us to be focused on his light, as we focus on his light, as we promote his light, as we focus on his truth, then that illuminates the darkness. That exposes the darkness. You don't have some special dispensation where God is calling on you to root out evil. You have a special dispensation where God is calling on you to be a light bearer for him. He illuminates the darkness through you as you shine his truth. And that's why a song I heard recently says, terrorize the lies with truth. That's how we terrorize the lies. And I, the reason I know that you're not to be speaking about these things is because it says it in verse 12. It's shameful to even speak of those things. That's pretty deep there, isn't it? No, you're, you're not to be exposing the darkness by speaking about the darkness all the time. You expose the darkness by speaking about the light of Jesus all the time. And I think we have missed the mark on that. 
uh, greatly in some ways. Now the last one here is walk in wisdom, not foolishness. My watch just buzzed telling me I've been at this for 50 minutes. I need to speed up. Walk in wisdom, not foolishness. And it starts, it starts there in verse 15. See again. Well, not again, but it has sort of the same uh, idea. But see. See carries this idea of being vigilant. Again, present active imperative, not going to go into again, again what that means. But see. Be vigilant about what? That you walk circumspectly. That means carefully, walking carefully or paying close attention. See that. Be careful. Be vigilant that you walk. Your manner of living is intentional. It's careful. You're paying close attention to what's going on. Now, what would that entail? Not, being, not as fools, but as wise. And then it says, and not unwise, but understanding. Not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. That's, how, that's what it would entail. Not being foolish, but instead being wise. Not being unwise, but being understanding. Understanding God's truth. See, foolish and unwise refer to one devoid of good sense or sound judgment. How often do we go through life because we're influenced by the world around us and we, we literally just have no good sense? We have no sound judgment because that can't come from our flesh. The only way we could have sound judgment is if it was the Spirit of God leading and directing. That's why it says, if a man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally. We don't have it naturally. This has to be God's Spirit providing this to us. So the idea is, allow your manner of living to be characterized by God's wisdom instead of the world's foolishness, and again, as directed by His Spirit. And what will the corresponding result be? You'll be redeeming the time. And that involves efficiently using or making the most of the time that God has given you, your most precious resource. And what is all this going to be conditioned on? Walking in wisdom instead of foolishness. It's going to be conditioned on understanding what the will of the Lord is. And how are you going to do that? Well, it's going to involve being transformed by the renewing of your mind we saw from Romans 12 too. What is that a reference to? It's a reference to God's word. God's will is revealed exclusively in his word. So how are you going to have God's wisdom? How are you going to have God's understanding? How is the spirit going to illuminate those truths to you? if you're not spending any time in his word? The answer is, you won't have that understanding. You'll be walking around foolishly. You'll be walking around without good sense. You'll be walking around without sound judgment, and you will not be living, leaving behind a legacy of faith that could positively influence those who come behind you. So the question we end with is, you're, gonna leave, you're going to leave a legacy. Let's say that together. You are going to leave a legacy. It's going to be good and helpful or bad and unhelpful to those that come behind you. And the question is, will you trust God enough to allow his spirit to work in and through you so that you can become over time an imitator of God so that his qualities and characteristics could be projected and could be lived out through you, not because of you, but in spite of you as you walk in dependence on him? Now, will that be true of you or will it not be true? That's a decision that each of us has to make. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we could spend together. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this time we can even share a meal together. Thank you that you're such a good God, that you mean what's best for us, that you want what's best for us. In Jesus' name, amen.